is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Francine Lacroix. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London, and here's what's coming up on today's program. UK yields surge after core inflation unexpectedly hit a 30-year high, raising new bets on higher interest rates. Traders fully priced in a peak BOE rate of 6% by December. China's yuan tumbles past $7.2 level, with investors wanting more stimulus from Beijing markets. Also cautious ahead of Fed Chair Jay Powell's semi-annual report to Congress. Plus, the EU announces a security plan to avoid over-reliance on China, potentially leading to some curbs on trade with Beijing. Now, there is quite a lot going on in today's market session, so let's start with the markets. A lot of the focus, of course, on S&P futures is what we hear from Jay Powell, the trajectory for inflation. He will be grilled a little bit later today. Traders ramping up bets, of course, of further Bank of England rate hikes. It's tomorrow, and this was after a much hotter than expected inflation print. So we're also looking at sterling, 127.35. It's not moving by a huge amount, although we're seeing huge moves when it comes to UK gilts. And so the focus is actually on what that means for interest rates going higher. Six percent, I spoke to our John Stepek, who yesterday was really pushing back against this. And he was saying, look, it may not be six percent, but we could have bigger heights than expected. And then, of course, longer term, the focus is what it means for mortgage uh, holders. The contrarian view is that the economy in the UK could be bigger or much stronger than expected. So that's a view overall for some of these stocks. I don't know whether uh, we also have other things that we need to look at. I don't know whether we have a map where we go straight to UK inflation coming in hotter than expected for a fourth month with the core rate rising to its highest level in more than 30 years. That's heaping pressure on the Bank of England and here's what the Chancellor had to say. Well today's figures strengthen the case for the government to stick to its guns. No matter what the pressure from left, right or centre, we won't be pushed off course. Because if we're going to help families, if we're going to relieve the pressure on people with mortgages, on businesses, we need to squeeze every last drop of high inflation out of the economy. And if you look at what's happening in other countries, you can see that rises in interest rates do bring down inflation over time. That will happen here. Well, joining us now is Gareth Davies. He's Exchequer Secretary to the UK Treasury. Mr. Davies, thank you so much for joining us. You look at the inflation number, and we took a double take because they're so high, unexpectedly so. Can you actually, can the government do anything to bring them down, or is it now all up to the Bank of England? Well, thank you for having me. I think, as the IMF has said uh, very recently, the UK government, the UK Treasury, is taking decisive action uh, to tackle inflation. That includes working very closely with the Bank of England to make sure that fiscal policy aligns with monetary policy, but also implementing actions such as the energy price guarantee, which the OBR have predicted will yeah. take off about 2% of inflation. So we are not I, complacent. I, but, but it's not working. If you look at the inflation figures, there's something that's not working. So are you not doing enough? Is the Bank of England not doing enough? Like, how do you work in tandem? Well, I think what today's figures show, as the Chancellor has said this morning, is that we need to stick with the plan. Yeah. It, it isn't going to happen overnight, but again, the IMF have shown through their forecast that they expect inflation to come drastically down this year and it's one of the Prime Minister's key priorities. So I think if we stick with the plan and that means making sure that we are fiscally prudent, not uh, exacerbating inflation through high spending and also, as I mentioned, putting in place measures uh, to hold back bills, for example, on energy uh, bills, that will help as well. But, but what happens with the plan? I mean, if you, if you look at the plan and every minister that comes here says, look, we're going to have inflation, it's just not possible. If you look at these figures, this is up to the Bank of England. So what are you expecting the Bank of England to do that could make your job easier? Well, we have an independent Bank of England, and it's, uh, it's up to the MPC. But as I said, what we can do in the Treasury is make sure that fiscal policy is aligned with monetary yeah. policy. The two work together, and it's up yeah. to the Bank of England ultimately what action they take. Yeah. Do you worry that the Bank of England will raise rates to a point where they have to put this country in a recession to deal with inflation? Well, both the Prime Minister and the Chancellor have made very clear that the key priority is getting inflation down. That is what is hurting families and businesses across this country, and that's our priority. It's up to the MPC what action they take, but as I said, we need to work with yeah. them on this. 
if family finances are horrific at the moment for, for many families across the country, especially for mortgage holders, is there anything that you can do to alleviate this pressure? Well, we are. We've implemented a program, an extensive program, both on energy uh, bills, but also cost of living support. And this totals around £94 billion pounds of support. We've essentially paid for half of the average household's uh, energy bill since October. And uh, we've just recently announced a new programme of uh, support for the disabled uh, and the, uh, in particular for the vulnerable. So we are putting but, in place. But them. given the numbers now, can you do more? Could you have more direct support? I know that the Chancellor has pushed back against it, but again, you're, you're in a precarious position politically and uh, some of the media today are saying you could lose a lot of seats. So could you go back on that decision? I think the number one thing that we have to do for families across the country is get inflation under control. Any measures that would increase borrowing uh, or exacerbate inflation would clearly not be to the benefit of anybody in this country. We have to stick with the plan and that's what we intend to do. What are you asking the banks to do today? It, we, in, in terms of sense? mortgages, in terms of, you know, if, if banks are, are kind of the last bastion to help support some of the families that are dealing with huge rising costs, what can the government do to help them or encourage them? Well, we know that it's a very worrying time for people with mortgages that are transitioning out of uh, fixed rates, for example. Uh, the Chancellor is meeting with uh, lenders this week to impress on them that they have a duty of care to their customers and banks do have a responsibility to work with anybody that is having financial difficulty to work out a plan so that they can pay their mortgage. Mr Davis, I understand that you're sticking to the plan. I understand that you, know, you talked about this fiscal policy together with monetary policy. We didn't see that working last autumn when the markets were all over the place. Again, if you look at guilds, they're moving quite a lot. Are there any measures that treasuries could put in place to make sure that fiscal and monetary policy work hand in hand in tandem? Well, I think we are doing that. As I say, we are being fiscally responsible on spending, uh, whether that's on public sector pay or putting in place measures that will not exacerbate inflation, such as the energy price guarantee. So I, I would suggest that we already are doing that. We just have to stick with it. Yeah, I, I understand. But so when is inflation coming down? Are we going to see better inflation figures in July? Well, let's see, but what the IMF and the OBR and the Bank of England have said is that they expect inflation to come uh, significantly down this year and the Prime Minister has made it a top priority for him to get it down. That is what we are yeah. hoping to see. But they were expecting inflation to come down this time around. Is there, I mean, the contrarian view is actually the UK economy is much stronger than expected. Do you subscribe to that? So we are seeing very resilient uh, domestic uh, demand and if you take core inflation, for example, we're seeing uh, some of the energy uh, uh, increases pass through into businesses and that's one of the reasons why we've got particularly high core inflation. We also had the coronation in May which has pushed up uh, uh, core inflation a little bit as well. So there and are Beyonce, factors at play. Beyonce tickets it, apparently also... I'm not going to rule but, out any, uh, any, yeah. any, uh, any hospitality event but particularly the coronation obviously. But um, there are a multitude of factors that are driving this but over the long term, over the course of this year, we do expect inflation to come down and we're sticking with the plan to get it there. A recession or no recession? G given the hike in interest rates that, that we could be seeing and certainly that the markets are pricing in. Well, uh, I'm not going to... Uh, predict uh, market, market activity and, and what we expect in the economy is for inflation to come down. We are very uh, laser-like focused on that because that ultimately will help us grow the economy. The Chancellor has announced, you know, for example, the five growth industries. We're making a series of measures on that. We've got the budget or a statement coming out uh, later in the autumn and you'll be hearing more uh, from him then as to what other action we can take on growth. How much is Brexit to blame for a lack of labour shortage? I think uh, if you look at uh, the, the uh, years after Brexit, we've grown at the same level uh, of Germany. We have one of the most competitive visa regimes uh, in the world. We're attracting academics and uh, innovative businesses in AI and other uh, amazing parts of the technological sector. So uh, I think we are resilient when it comes to migration. I think we've got it about right. But ov obviously we always want... Um, really talented, successful people to move to Britain, and thankfully they are. Is there anything else that you can do to try and attract more people to the workforce? I, well, in the budget uh, in March, uh, the Chancellor announced a, a range of measures to boost workforce participation, not least uh, radical reforms to our childcare system, for example, as well as our pension reforms, which will help the, uh, in particular, you know, older workers uh, remain or, or come back to the workforce. Yeah. And so that is a critical part of our plan.
Mr. Davis, are you frustrated every time you look at an inflation figure and it's not going the way you're expecting it to, that you're hoping it to? What's the level of frustration, government? It makes us more determined to stick with the plan to get inflation down and to not divert from that by uh, making un unfunded uh, borrowing uh, spending commitments, for example. Uh, we have to be disciplined. We have to stick with the plan. I'm confident that that will work in the end. So you're basically confident the Bank of England? Right, that they'll, they'll get this under control. Is that the way I should interpret it? Uh, I'm confident in the Treasury's okay. ability to work with the Bank of England to stick okay. with the plan. Uh, Mr. Davies, thank you so much for joining us. Gareth Davies there, Exchequer Secretary to the UK uh, Treasury. Now, we're also uh, listening and looking at live pictures from the Ukraine Recovery Conference being jointly held by Ukraine and the UK here in London, where uh, the Prime Minister has just taken to the podium in the last couple of minutes, speaking about some of the support that, of course, the UK can give British to Ukraine. You can continue watching, of course, the Ukraine a Recovery today, Conference. We'll That's on LIV EGO on the Bloomberg Terminal. Coming up, We'll have plenty more, of course, on markets. We'll look at Gilts and the Bank of England tomorrow. This is Bloomberg. We're also launching a new UK-Ukraine tech bridge to foster investment and talent, along with support for green energy and more. All part of a vast collective effort. Economics, finance, politics, this is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition of from Sinaqua here in London. Now, Italy's right-wing government came to power last year with a promise to safeguard the Italianness of its most important firms. Now, Rome has put its money where its mouth is, enacting new measures to curb Chinese control over tire maker Pirelli and placing foreign investors and other Italian companies on notice. Well, Bloomberg's Oliver Crook joins us with the very latest on this interesting story. So, what exactly happened here? That's right, Francine, and no, uh, no, no risk of you not safeguarding your Italianness. But basically, Pirelli, obviously the tire maker, massive in Italy. Its biggest shareholder is Sinochem, a state-owned uh, Chinese company. And basically, last week, the Chinese government, Maloney's government, come, came in and stepped in using the so-called golden power rights, basically imposing restrictions on what information that the investor could get and trying to restrict the control it can have over the firm. The consequence of that, we have learned now, is that this deputy CEO who was slated to take over the business is now departing because this was a joint plan from the Italian and the Chinese side of the business for him to take over. He's a long-term ally of the CEO. However, the reason that this is now happening, even if he was agreed to by the Italian side of the business, is that they want to purge any doubt of who's in control of this company. And so the next CEO will have to be appointed just from the Italian side of the business. So two sides of this. The first, Maloney doing what she pledged to do, which is to take a more active role in the economy and in corporations more broadly. The second, you also have this de-risking from Chinese firms, and it takes many, firm, uh, many forms. And if you want to get the sort of early case study on what it looks like in Italy, here it is. I think there's no way around dialogue. Dialogue is super important to do that, to get back to the table if you want. I wish sometimes, as uh, I lived a lot in Asia, that uh, the Germans uh, also understand that it is not always better or worse, it's just different. And that is the comments from the CATL CEO yesterday from the German business lobby. I spoke to him while Premier Lee was here. So there's still some hope from a lot of these firms because when you think about de-risking, it's not, it's not just companies, Chinese companies that have stakes in European companies. It's these huge European companies that have operations in China and increasingly Chinese companies like CATL that have operations here in Europe. So the de-risk, <clears throat> really a panoply of meanings, um, is going to be a very complex issue for these companies to navigate. Ollie, thank you so much. As always, uh, Bloomberg's Oliver Crook there in Berlin. Now, we're also getting some live pictures from the Ukraine Recovery a Conference being jointly headed by Ukraine and the UK here in London. We're just hearing from President Zelensky of Ukraine talking by a video link. A short while ago, he was introduced by the Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak. Let's listen in to President Zelensky. And destroys and kills. But you and I... And right now, we are able to protect life and overcome the ruins after the Russian aggression is such a way as to block the path for evil, meaning for any new aggressions. The eyes of the world are looking at us and at whether we will defeat Russian aggression exactly as freedom deserves to win, that is without compromising our values. Also, the world 
is watching to see if we will restore normal life in such a way that our transformation will land an ideological defeat on the aggressor. We protect Ukraine, and thus we protect freedom. And when we build Ukraine, we'll build freedom. Country, region, continent, world. It's a global task. And I want to thank you. And of course, I, I thank Switzerland, Germany, France, Italy, every country where we have agreed on key principles for recovery. At this conference, we must move from vision to agreements and from agreements to real projects. Well, you can watch, of course, more of the Ukraine Recovery Conference on Live Go on your Bloomberg terminal. Now, the U.S. Coast Guard says that underwater noises have been detected in the search for a submersible vessel that's missing with five crew on board and less than 30 hours of oxygen remaining. U.S. rescuers have been joined by research vessels from Canada and France and the scene about 900 nautical miles east of Cape Cod, Massachusetts. Air searches have so far failed to find any signs of the missing 6.7 meter long craft. Now coming up, the EU is announcing an economic security plan. We'll look at what that might include. We also go back to guilds ahead of the BOE tomorrow. This is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition on Francine Lacqua here in London. Now, China's yuan tumbled past the closely watched 7.2 per dollar level as investor sentiment soured on a lack of aggressive stimulus to boost the country's faltering recovery. Now, let's bring in our Asia executive editor for Asia Markets. He's Paul Dobson in Singapore. So, Paul, what exactly does this tell us about stress ahead? Hi, good morning, Fran. Um, well, you know, the, the, the trend has been there for a while for China um, on, on, on a sort of downward looking uh, trajectory. And this month we've had something of a, a mini revival, something of a rally um, as hopes built that we would uh, get some details of some more policy stimulus um, to match um, the, the efforts on the, on the monetary front that we've seen in, in some reductions in uh, lending rates. Thus far, the details that we've had on it have been very thin um, and, and meager, despite um, leaks of some uh, more interesting stuff coming down the way. There was a big policy meeting on Friday, and a lot of investors had been expecting that following that, there would be this kind of um, uh, uh, barrage of announcements that would give the market some confidence again that China can turn its economy around and build that trust again. But thus far, not very much at all. And the concern now is, you know, what actually is coming? Is there going to be something that's, that's big enough to turn around uh, what is very uh, miserable or, or dour sentiment for China's markets at the moment? And, no. you know, some of the reporting that we've had sort of saying that um, uh, the, the Chinese officials yeah. have been asking the industry what they could do to turn things around equally has people worried that, you know, maybe there just isn't going to be that much and maybe, you know, kind of um, the, the outlook yeah, isn't that good for China's economy as a result. Yeah, Paul, very quickly, in 10 seconds, why have we not had more support from Chinese policymakers? It is hard. I don't think they know exactly what to do. You know, what they really need more than anything else is to build confidence in the property market. But that requires time. Time would be the great healer there. And that's not something that they really have as far as the markets are concerned right now. Paul, thanks so much. Uh, Paul Dobson there in Singapore. Now, the EU has announced its economic security strategy, a plan to avoid dependence on countries such as China. Now, measures include increasing oversight of critical technologies and possible screening of investments coming into and out of the bloc. Here with me, Bloomberg's Europe correspondent, Maria Tadeo. So, Maria, what exactly is in this plan from the EU? Yes, Francine, and it's funny also that you played uh, those live pictures from the Ukraine Reconstruction Conference, where we know uh, the head of the commission is in London today, and the two stories are in some ways connected, because it is a Russian invasion of Ukraine that has 
triggered this rethinking about trade relationships from the European Union and the countries it does trade with. And this idea before that was personated or impersonated by Angela Merkel for so long of the more you trade, the better diplomatic relationships that you will have has been decimated to the core because of the war in Ukraine. So the two are connected. And yes, yesterday, the head of the commission presented this new strategy. She says this is about promoting the European Union to protecting made in Europe, but also finding the right partners to do trade with. The big elephant in the room is what happens with China. This is a good market for European Union goods. We all know this. It has been a profitable market, too, but there are concerns about mm -hmm. risky areas. And von der Leyen has been clear on this. No decouple, but yes, to de-risk. And so she talks about looking at those sectors, particularly the high-end technology, where it could be problematic. And the most extreme cases, Francine, we could see screening on outbound investments, but also potentially a ban to supply in some of that technology to China. Mm. Uh, Maria, thank you so much, Maria Tadeo, there in Brussels with, of course, the very latest on this important, important topic. Now, the other important topic is what's happening with UK inflation coming in hotter than expected. A lot of concern about what that means for mortgage holders and family finances. And also, it's moving, of course, gilts. We're seeing a repricing of how high interest rates can go here in the UK uh, from here until the end of the year. Coming up, we'll talk about that 30-year high for UK core CPI. And, of course, we'll look ahead to the BOE decision tomorrow. We speak to Nina Scarrow. This is Bloomberg. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London, and this is what the markets are doing. Now, there's a lot of focus, of course, or there will be a lot of focus on what Jay Powell will do next. The focus, of course, is on his testimony. And then the other thing is UK inflation overshooting once again. That's definitely boosting pressure on rates. Now, gilts are slumping after UK inflation came in hotter than expected for a fourth month, leading to a fresh flurry of bets on higher interest rates. Core CPI, excluding food and energy, accelerated unexpectedly to 7.1 percent. So let's get straight to Valerie Titel, our markets reporter. Valerie, 50 basis points. I mean, it's now in the cards for tomorrow. Look, it is, Francine, especially when you look at the details of the CPI print and you see that it is in the most sticky components that the that UK is having problems with inflation. It really begs the question, if the Bank of England is going to hike more, why not front load these interest rate hikes? Why not just do a jumbo, ba uh, jumbo rate rise tomorrow, make it 50 basis points? But the market right after that CPI print went into price a 6% terminal rate. Thankfully, we've come off a bit that now. We're pricing in now 5.9%, but it exceeded mm. the trust error a high. I know everyone likes to talk about uh, how the terminal rate went nuts last September. Well, it's risen in, in a very similar pace in the last few weeks. The market is saying, really, if, if the Bank of England is serious about fighting inflation, uh, there is going to be a risk of a hard landing. And the way we know that is we look at the FX markets, because normally when you have a rise in interest rates, it strengthens the currency. But what we're seeing today in cable is that it is weakening versus the U.S. dollar. It's fallen uh, nearly a quarter of a percent that is not a good look when it comes to the outlook for UK growth. Yeah, it certainly doesn't. Valerie, thank you so much. Our Valerie Titel there with some of the terminal rates pricing. Now let's get more on the UK economy as the BOE <coughs> faces pressure to hike more aggressively when it meets tomorrow. Joining us now is Nina Scarrow, Chief Executive Officer of the Centre for Economics and Business Research. Nina, I mean, good morning. It's a nightmare scenario, really, for a lot of families out there. What, what do you see the trajectory for inflation looking like? I think I'm, I'm not that surprised by this morning's reading. I do think we're going to see a deceleration in the coming months. So I don't think the, 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 there's very little to be, to be encouraged by by this morning's. But I no. also don't think there is the need for this complete sense of panic. And I Because of coronation or because of the timing of it? I think I, I think just it, it would not that unreasonable and inflation didn't start reading. There is a little bit of seasonal adjustments that maybe weren't done. You know, there is always a little bit of trickiness um, around that. So I do think that some of the stickiness in mm. prices in the services sector, as you say, yeah. there is the bank holiday. There has been good yeah. weather as well. So I think there is a little bit of that. It seems that food price inflation probably has peaked as well. So there's a little bit of good news, but very little. But I still hope that the Bank of England now isn't sort of springing into panic mode 
road yeah. and thinking that they need to drastically change the outcome of their mm -hmm. decision tomorrow. But I don't. Is 50 basis points a drastic change? I mean, what what you know? Does it make more sense for for them to actually hike more tomorrow and then wait and see how j the July numbers come in? I actually don't think so. I think sticking mm -hmm. with what would have probably everybody agreeing being the case before this inflation. Yeah. Um, reading and sticking with a 25 basis point is still the right thing to to do and mm -hmm. I think the messaging from the Bank of England needs to be yes inflation came in higher than consensus expectations but that is because it is taking time for the hiking mm -hmm. we've already done to feed yeah. through and it's very important to remember that the Bank of England has a trickier job to manage the housing market and the mortgage situation yeah. than other developed market central banks mm -hmm. like the ECB like the Fed the situation is a lot more precarious in the UK you, meaning that if mortgages go too high, then they, they could have a recession on their hands because of the number of mortgages available and the fact that they roll over, right, every, every Exactly. Year. It's relatively unusual yeah. to have the situation in the UK where, you know, a five-year fixed mortgage is actually yeah. considered a long-term fix. It's very unusual in the US, in yeah. France, in, in Germany, in a lot of the European markets. You can fix a mortgage for the duration of it. So here, the pain is going to be a lot more stark once that time comes, which I think is going to be later this year year and into 2024. And you know, I don't know whether there is panic on the markets, but certainly there's a bit of, you know, a, a lot of question marks, at least there's also to, to market repricing about the aggressiveness of interest rate hikes because inflation seems to have peaked or going down in other countries. Is there a structural problem with inflation now in the UK? It's definitely very worrying, the trend we're seeing in core inflation, yeah. because it's, I mean, you could say it's sticky, but it's probably a little bit worse than sticky at this point. It's actually heading the, the wrong direction. It's hard to say exactly why the UK is proving different. It's, it's easier to see the difference with the US that hasn't had as much of the spike in energy prices. It's a little bit harder to see why it's so, the picture is different than what we're seeing in Europe. Brexit could be a part of the, the reasoning, but probably not the, the big explanation. So I do think there is a, there is a sort of a UK specific situation but I don't think the path needs to be that different than what we've seen in the US and what we've seen in Europe. Uh, Nina, do you think interest rates will actually be 6% which is which is what currently is priced in the markets? Our John Stepek who does a fabulous newsletter um, called Money is Still saying look he, he's not expecting 6% maybe they'll nudge higher but again it, it could also show the fact that the, the UK economy is more resilient than we think that's a contrarian view. I don't think we're going to see rates at 6%. I don't think we're going to see rates that close to 6%. I think we're probably looking at one 25 basis hike tomorrow and then, then another 50 basis points spread out yeah. over the rest of the year. And I think that will be it. And the reason for that is the bank is, as you said earlier, sort of between a rock and a hard place in yeah. terms of controlling inflation, but not imposing more pain on mortgage holders. And if it has to phase those two really imperfect choices between having <coughs> higher inflation for longer and just crashing the housing market, I think they're going to go with tolerating higher inflation yeah. for longer. So what I don't understand is the government keeps on saying, look, one of their priorities is to have inflation. They're sticking to the plan. We had a minister that kept on saying we're sticking to the plan. I mean, how, what can the government do at this point, if not support mortgage holders? What can they do to get that inflation? It's a tough pill to swallow. I mean, monetary policy, I mean, part of the explanation that nobody mm -hmm. wants to kind of put to, to the people, put to the electorate, is that the way that we get inflation under control is to hit people's spending power, yeah. is for people to, you know, to, to rein in how much they're spending, or, you know, to, frankly, for probably unemployment to go up, or at least for people to start thinking that unemployment go up and adjust their behaviors accordingly. So nobody in the public space wants to say that to the electorate. It's a very mm -hmm. unpleasant message, but that is essentially what the government is hoping that once we actually people start feeling the impacts of these higher interest rates I would say probably about you know there is 1.9 million mortgages that are still due to refinance before the end of 2024 so once those people start really feeling the impact on their own wallets I do think they're going to rein in spending I do think inflation is going to come down more significantly we're going to see slowing growth but it's not a great message to put out there which is why I think the government is sort of taking a step back saying we're not going to intervene and support mortgage holders but we also don't feel the need to do no. anything else more aggressive but longer term you're not expecting six percent interest rates but is there the only way to take inflation down is it to actually put this country in a recession 
I'm still hoping that sort of we can get there with very, very low, but sort of around 0% growth. I mean, difference between a ve- mild recession and very low growth in terms of you know, how people feel isn't that, isn't that difficult. I do think there is still a very narrow path out that would avoid that hard landing of seeing a, seeing a recession, but it is getting sort of the path is getting narrower yeah. and narrower. All right, Nina, thank you so much, as always, for joining us. Uh, Nina Scaro, Chief Executive Officer of the Center of Economics and Business Research. We're also getting some breaking news out of IFO. Uh, the German economy has shrunk more than initially estimated, uh, minus 0.4% in 2023, and then they're seeing a slower rebound in 2024. Uh, IFO, the Info Institute, also says that inflation in Germany will hit 2.1% in 2024. That's in line <clears throat> with the ECB target. Now, the Farfetch founder and chief executive, Jose Neves, says customers are spending more money on sustainable brands. Now, the tech entrepreneur spoke to me on Leaders with L'Aqua Goes Green. Consumers that shop conscious products are growing much faster than the average of the marketplace. This is very important because we can go back to the brands and say, look, if you do the right thing, consumers will appreciate and will provide you with very, very granular data at product level on what is important for consumers and how much consumers are willing to pay for it. Well, that was a far-fetched founder and chief executive officer, Jose Neves, featuring on the latest episode of Leaders with L'Aqua Goes Green. You can catch that on Bloomberg TV and online. Now, these are live pictures of the European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen from the Ukraine Recovery Conference being jointly held here in London by Ukraine and the UK. We'll have plenty more on that. This is Bloomberg. I believe the European Union has a special responsibility. And the reason is simple. We heard the president. Ukrainians tell us that when they imagine their future, they see Europe's flag flying over their cities. And I have no doubt that Ukraine will be part of our union. So today, Today, I want to announce two new steps. The first is about Ukraine's reforms. Economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London. Now, after U.S. housing data surprised to the upside yesterday, traders are looking out for the Fed chair's congressional testimony later today at 3 p.m. London time. Bloomberg Economics sees Powell doubling down on his commitment to fight inflation. Now, Bloomberg's Jill Dices joins us with the very latest. Jill, good morning, good afternoon. U.S. Housing Starts data surged unexpectedly last month. What does it actually mean for how Powell needs to navigate this? Yeah, so um, actually this data uh, was pretty positive for the uh, U.S. economy. Um, Now, uh, we already saw a bit of this from Jay Powell um, speaking last week, indicated maybe that, um, you know, the housing market was starting to stabilize. I think that that's what this data was showing you. And ultimately what it tells us is that uh, for U.S. um, GDP figures for the second quarter, um, we might see some positive contribution um, from home building for the first time since I think 2021. Uh, So yes, ultimately I think this is, um, you know, we're going to see additional uh, data points reinforcing the, this in the days and uh, in the weeks to come. But uh, yes, a very surprising set of data to the upside here. So we'll hear more, of course, from the Fed chair a little bit later. Is there anything else that he really needs to address head on? Yeah, well, look, I think that um, ultimately what we saw out of that FOMC meeting last week from Powell is that um, we're not really is that he was trying to justify why it was that interest rates were on pause uh, right, you know, right in, in June. Um, or if only, you know, the, the idea was that the Fed was going to return to raising interest rates uh, next month, um, possibly a second time later this year. I think that what Powell is going to have to do here is to try to reinforce that hawkish message and better articulate to lawmakers um, how exactly he stands to do this. Also, remember that um, at the same time, we've got these upcoming Fed confirmation meetings um, for uh, a couple of members. And so it's going to be interesting to see how much of that sort of translates into um, additional reinforcement, um, you know, from somebody like Jefferson, for example, on, um, uh, you know, continuing that hawkish policy and how others sort of weigh into that uh, calculus. So ultimately today, look out for just further comments from Powell sort of, um, you know, sort of proving or articulating why it is that maybe there's two more rate hikes uh, on the cards for 2023. 
All right, Jill, thank you so much, as always, for all of your insight. Jill Adesis there on the very latest of Jay Powell. Now, we also need to check the very latest on guilds. So we did have a robust uh, conversation, of course, with one of the people working under the Chancellor of the Exchequer. He has told us that he will stick to the plan. Now, the UK inflation figure is not good. It remained higher than expected for a fourth month, leading to a flurry of bets that the Bank of England will raise interest rates to near 6% and drive up the cost of mortgages higher. Uh, the figure, of course, is raising the prospect that the Bank of England is opting for a bigger rate increase on Thursday, adding to the quickest monetary tightening in four decades. And you can see UK two-year yields 5025. Coming up, the Ukraine Recovery Conference takes place where world leaders will discuss the war-torn country's future. So we'll have plenty more on that. We'll put that into context also with debt and spending. This is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. A lot of the focus is on two things. First of all, Jay Powell, he's testifying a little bit later. And then the firm focus is, of course, what's happening with UK inflation. So it overshot again. That puts a lot more pressure on the Bank of England. They have a decision tomorrow that core inflation jumping unexpectedly. Now, what this means is that not only is there a flurry of bets that the Bank of England will raise interest rates to near 6% and drive up the cost of mortgages higher, this is really difficult for the Bank of England to calibrate because of the dependency, of course, of mortgages on the housing market and the dependency on the housing market for the economy. And then, uh, of course, this has huge implications also on what it means for gilts going forward. Now, remember, there was a separate report showing that government debt today now exceeds the size of the UK economy for the first time since 1961. This also imperils uh, the Prime Minister's promise to restore health to public finances and to cut inflation. So gilts on the move after UK inflation, as we know, came in hotter than expected. It's a fourth month that's happened. And again, it changes everything to what we're expecting the Bank of England to do. Core CPI, excluding food and energy prices, actually accelerated uh, to 7.1%. So let's get straight to our Valerie Titella, our markets reporter. Now, Valerie, the problem if you're the Bank of England, you don't want to hurt mortgages because this economy is so dependent on housing prices that are so dependent with variable mortgages, but you have an inflation problem. Yeah, right. That's the pickle, right? Do, do they uh, maybe not be as aggressive with their rate rises as the market wants them to be? Because they know in three to six months time that the rise in mortgage rates is really about to bite the consumer and that will bite growth and hence bite inflation. It's this pickle. But the, the thing is, is that inflation keeps surprising again and again to the upside, uh, leaving the market to think that the Bank of England can't can't afford to be patient, can't afford to wait for these yeah. lags of monetary policy to hit the economy. They need to be more forceful now if they want to keep credibility. Yeah, I mean, some people are saying that, look, because of the coronation, because of a couple of events, let's wait to July and, and not cry panic yet. But certainly the markets have latched onto this and are moving quite significantly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the, the risk out there for the markets is that maybe Bailey does try to sound a bit more a bit d more dovish than we expect in exactly saying those kind of lines a and the market really takes that as a signal that maybe the Bank of England is losing a bit of control here and we see perhaps the opposite reaction in the markets that that maybe a dovish surprise would want right he could be dovish and instead of rates rallying we get another spike higher in yields because we start to get worried that the Bank of England is falling farther and farther behind on their yeah. inflation fight and, and I wonder if the markets are still scarred but what happened in autumn where, when you had this fight between fiscal and monetary policy. Yeah, definitely. And uh, hey, the markets are really scarred by what uh, Bailey has done in the past. Remember, he has surprised us before uh, hiking when he said he wasn't going to. He surprised us before with jumbo rate rises. So don't put it past him that a 50 basis point rate rise could be in the cards tomorrow. Um, the, the thing that really worries me about the market reaction today is we're seeing a move lower in sterling. Now, we normally don't see that when we see interest rates rising in the UK. And that's a really quite negative signal, I think, for 
the outlook for UK growth, that perhaps these higher interest rates are really going to cause uh, some sort of hard landing in the UK. And it's playing out in the FX markets and sterling is falling uh, nearly three tenths of a percent versus yeah. the dollar. A contrarian view is actually the economy is much stronger than expected. And again, we could see that in the next couple of, of numbers. Why is the UK in a microcosm where actually inflation's stickier and higher than in other places where we're seeing it go down? Um, is it all the labor shortage or is it something else? Uh, Brexit had a big deal to, to play with it. The labor shortage that you mentioned driving uh, wage increases, which is a very, very sticky component of inflation and really hard uh, to crack unless you get unemployment to rise. But again, you know, of the developed nations of the world, the UK is really the standout and the one who hasn't been able to see core inflation turn around. And the tightness of the labor market is one of those drivers, Brexit being perhaps the background that started this, uh, this labor market tightness. Uh, but again, you know, other components of inflation uh, especially in this print today, aren't necessarily reflecting a better growth dynamic. It's more in the, the stickier components where uh, it's, it's more of a risk of stagflation that this print is showing us rather than a worry that the economy is still running too hot. Yeah, Valerie, thank you so much. Uh, Valerie Titel there with the very latest on the markets and, of course, what this inflation print means. Now, the other picture, of course, is what we're expecting Jay Powell to say. Um, the picture overall, we're also seeing actually live pictures of the U.S. Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, from the Ukraine Recovery Conference. So let's listen in to what the Secretary of the State has to say. He's also just come back from China. About what all of us are doing together with Ukraine to help it recover. We never lose sight of that human dimension because at the end of the day, that's what it's all about. Back in April, just one day in this devastating aggression, in the city of Uman, hundreds of miles from the front lines, another assault of Russian missiles on innocent Ukrainian civilians, on apartment buildings, hundreds of miles away. In one of those buildings, before dawn, a Russian missile struck. The father, Dimitro, in his apartment, raced to his children's room. He opened the door to the room to try to see how his children, Kirillo, 17, and Sophia, 11, were doing. He opened the door to the room. It wasn't there anymore. His children were gone. Two of the six children killed that one day, that one day in April, as a result of this ongoing aggression against Ukraine. Two of thousands killed through the course of this war. Two lives interrupted. Two stories stopped. That's what this is about every day. But as Russia continues to destroy, we are here to help Ukraine rebuild. Rebuild lives, rebuild its country, rebuild its future. Recovery is about more than just ensuring people have what they need to survive. Food to eat, water to drink, medicine to take, heat in the winter, electricity in all seasons. Recovery is about laying the foundation for Ukraine to thrive as a secure, independent country, fully integrated with Europe. Connected to well, that was the U.S. Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, speaking from the Ukraine Recovery Conference here in London. You can continue watching on Live Go, L-I-V Go, on your Bloomberg terminal. And, of course, the big question is whether he'll talk about China after spending a couple of days, the first time that we saw a high-ranking U.S. official go to the country in about five years. Tomorrow, we'll also have an exclusive interview with the Deutsche Bank Chief Executive Christian Saving. So don't miss that conversation. Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition continues in the next hour, Kriti Gupta in New York, Danny Berger here in London. And of course, the focus is on Jay Powell a little bit later on. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Danny Berger and Kriti Gupta. It's 10 a.m. in London, 5 a.m. in New York, and 5 p.m. in Hong Kong, our top stories today. 
Another hot CPI. The latest read on UK inflation comes in higher than expected for a fourth consecutive quarter. Gilt's decline as investors ramp up bets that the BOE hikes to 6%. Over in the U.S., Fed Chair Powell is gearing up for his two-day testimony on Capitol Hill. The chair is expected to face questions over additional policy tightening after the Fed paused in its last meeting. And FedEx painting a gloomy picture for 2024. The courier's profit outlook comes in lower than Wall Street's estimates amid weak demand. Welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance. This is the early edition. I'm Danny Berger in London. Kriti Gupta is in New York. And Kriti, the bond vigilantes in the UK, they're at it again after that hot CPI print. Yeah, in a really big way to the point that's having ripple effects in the U.S. session. You're really seeing it with the action you're seeing in the bond market stateside as well, even this early on at a time when futures are virtually unchanged. Danny, you are seeing red on the screen, the S&P futures, 44.33 on that contract, but kind of a wait and see approach. You're seeing it in NASDAQ futures. You're seeing it in Russell futures essentially everyone's saying there's no real direction uh, for the stock market at least at 5 30 a.m new york time or 5 a.m new york time excuse me but the bond market to your point danny is where you are seeing some of the action already seeing a little bit of volatility on the front end of the curve probably taking a cue out of what you're seeing in the uk we'll get to that in just a moment before 71 on the two-year yield a move higher of two basis points it was as high as about four to five basis points earlier in the session so again you are seeing volatility in the bond market even this early as american traders wake up to me the currency market is always interesting though because as we see those yield fluctuations the dollar traditionally follows but today the biggest kind of uh, weaker weakness you're seeing in the currency space is in the Japanese yen again a lot of the pricing coming around the BOJ and just the real expectation that the BOJ is going to do nothing to tweak their yield curve control and what that does though is weaken to the point that you see a little bit of a tailwind into the greenback that currency pair 141.97 a little bit of strength to the greenback to the tune of four tenths of one percent now Danny I put gold up here as well because I think for a commodity check, if we're talking about recession, inflation, and of course the yield picture, it's important to see how gold reacts as well. And right now you're seeing a little bit of a pullback, 1934 on that precious metal. Remember when we were talking about yields higher would perhaps push the gold price higher as well to above 2000 sustainably? That narrative seems to be lost in the wind today. Yeah, we just can't seem to crack $2,000 there, can we? But you just want to quickly walk us through what's happening in UK markets right now, because there's a lot of whipsaw here. First of all, we got to 6% pricing for BOE terminal rate. The chart I have in front of me for our radio listeners is February 2024 BOE pricing. Now, we've backed off of 6%. But we're at 5.9. At one point, we exceeded those trust highs. Again, after that inflation print, we're going to talk to our Lizzie Burden in just a moment about the exact details. But let's flip it up and let me show you the reaction across European assets. So on Monday, UK yields go up 14 basis points. Yesterday, they dropped 13 basis points. At the moment, they have paired some of the height of what we've seen. We're up about six basis points. At one point, it was 14 and a half. So things have calmed down. But I don't know. It's kind of hard to call this market calm. We're back above 5%. And this is the worrying dynamic. Usually, the gut punch reaction to higher yields is you trade based off that yield differential. You want to buy the currency of the nation that has the higher yields. That's not what is happening in the UK right now. Sterling is declining, uh, declining versus the dollar, about three tenths of 1% because even higher yields can attract investors into this country if we're not going to have any growth. If we're looking at a future that looks something like stagflation. Critty, you mentioned it's moving UK bonds, certainly moving Germany bonds too. Front end moves higher by two tenths of 1%. And overall, a not great day for stocks. European stocks declining every day this week so far. Today is no exception. Down a tenth of a percent. The worst performing, as you might expect, are the mid-cap UK stocks. So just to reiterate on this Story. UK inflation for May came in hotter than expected for a fourth month in a row. And this adds pressure on the Bank of England to hike more aggressively when it meets tomorrow. Here's UK Chancellor of the Exchequer, Jeremy Hunt, reacting to the numbers. Well, today's figures strengthen the case for the government to stick to its guns. No matter what the pressure from left, right or centre, we won't be pushed off course. Because if we're going to help families, if we're going to relieve the pressure on people with mortgages, on businesses, we need to squeeze every last drop of high inflation out of the economy. And if you look at what's happening in other countries, you can see that rises in interest rates do bring down inflation over time. That will happen here. 
For more on this, let's get to Lizzie Burden, our UK correspondent. Lizzie, what's your read on the CPI data this morning and what it means for the BOE? So the fourth straight upside surprise for the UK CPI print. It looks like a 13th consecutive hike from the Bank of England tomorrow is nailed on. It stayed on hold at 8.7% when it was expected to fall to 8.4%. But more worryingly than the headline rate is the core number. That was expected to stay on hold. It's risen. Services have risen again. The last time that core inflation was at this level, the Bank of England had to counter with interest rates of 15%. Now, it's driven by air travel, second-hand cars, culture and recreation, the Beyoncé effect. <laughs> um, but it's as a result meant, as you were talking about, that markets are now fully pricing 6% as the peak rate for the Bank of England. Some traders seeing 6.25%. And remember, this means, first of all, that a half point hike may be on the table for tomorrow. But worse, the, the worst thing is that Bloomberg Economics has seen a recession if rates get to 6%. And Lizzie, what, talk about the impact on the fiscal side of things. What does the government do from here? Well, Critty, three of the Prime Minister's top five priorities are economic, halving inflation by the end of the year, growing the economy, cutting the debt. Look how that's going. The inflation is not budging. As a result, the Bank of England's going to hike even more. That's potentially, as I say, going to harm growth further. And for the first time since the 1960s, you've got the debt-to-GDP debt ratio above 100%. On top of that, it's front-page news across the UK newspapers that mortgage rates are spiralling. Uh, so this is really difficult stuff. We were just speaking to Exchequer Secretary of the Treasury, uh, Gareth Davis, on Bloomberg Radio. That full interview will be on the Bloomberg UK Politics podcast later today. But he was saying that the government is not going to do anything that's going to counter the Bank of England's action to control inflation when it comes to helping out mortgage borrowers. The thing is, it really is painful. The Resolution Foundation already said it was going to cost £3,000 extra a year for people who are refinancing and those people are going to vote soon. Yeah, that cost of living crisis just getting worse and worse. Lizzie Burden, our UK correspondent over all things BOE and, of course, fiscal side as well. We thank you, as always. Bringing it back to the states here, Fed Chair Jay Powell set to testify to Congress later today, delivering his semi-annual monetary policy report to the House Financial Services Committee. For more, Bloomberg's Jill Deeses joins us now. Jill, we're coming off the heels of a pause at the end of the day, something that is kind of a skeptical approach when it comes to monetary policy, considering uh, the trends we've seen in the last few decades. What can we expect to hear from the testimony today? Right. Well, I think that um, what Jay Powell really needs to do here is sort of reinforce that hawkish message that he was trying to convey during, you know, the press conference last week. Because, yes, you're right. I think it's a little bit of a difficult line to walk. And we saw this uh, last week where he says, OK, well, we're going to pause in June and then, um, you know, leave the door open. There's going to be a live meeting in July where, you know, certainly the heavy implication is that there's going to be another rate hike. Um, and then if you look at that Fed dot plot, um, we're expecting we're pricing, we're supposed to be pricing in yet another rate hike by the end of the year. Um, I think what you've seen so far from investors is that they're not quite buying that picture. I think everybody is sort of there's consensus building around the idea that there is going to be another rate hike in July, um, but it is a you know a bit more complex beyond that. So I think what Powell's really going to have to do here is to drive home that idea of like this is still hawkish policy. Um, sort of figure out how to justify the fact that there was this um you know this pause, this um, you know hawkish skip or whatever you want to call it in June. Um, I think you know what we've seen conveyed in the past on that has been okay. Well, the Fed wants to preserve some flexibility ability to sort of change policy as they need to. It's supposed to be very data driven, sort of watching what a lot of these core indicators look like, how inflation is coming along and sort of preserving that room to either, you know, continue to raise rates or to pause in there. But yeah, it's it's a tricky balance, I think, uh, for Powell right now. And also, I just want to add, remember, you've also got some uh, uh, nominations for Fed positions going on at the same time. And so it's going to be interesting to see how a lot of this sort of comes together and coalesces into this message from the Fed. Um, is it all going to be, you know, sort of this, this mm. hawkishness, Curbing inflation, that kind of uh, that kind of messaging here. How does the U.S. data from yesterday complicate things, Joe? When you have housing starts uh, surging in May by the most since 2016. Yeah, I think that that's a really interesting one, right? Because um, this is certainly unexpected data, and I think ultimately, you know, proves um, well for the for the sort of the steam that the economy has, right? I mean, um, at this point, I think we've seen some economist estimates suggesting that um, this home builder data um, is, um, you know, expected to show that home building should contribute uh, positively to GDP growth in the second quarter uh, for the first time since I think 2021. Um, so it certainly indicates that there's, um, you know, demand there. Um, home builders are, you know, possibly more optimistic about, you know, some. some 
some uh, shoring up of supply chain snags, that kind of thing. Although, you know, I'd say that we should temper this a little bit. Um, you know, mortgage uh, mortgage rates are still elevated, so there's a limit to that demand. Um, but yeah, it's sort of it's it's all coming at an interesting time because it's certainly positive momentum for the economy there. Um, I think we're we're supposed to get additional data that sort of shows us how the housing market is shoring up. But again, this it, it just want to end on like you know this reiterates going back to what Powell was saying last week and week during the FOMC presser, like you know the housing market is stabilizing. So it does kind of you know um, gel with uh, some things that we've already heard out of him in particular. Bloomberg's Jill Desis walking us through a lot, what's going to be likely a major market mover today. Thank you. As always, we're going to go from the macro to the micro. One stock we're watching this morning is FedEx. The Courier reported earnings and a profit outlook that missed analyst expectations for more. Bloomberg Simone Foxman walks us through the numbers. A 10% cut to global sales. I mean, that's enormous. Uh, what is that? What is that telling us? Well, certainly, I think there was this feeling around uh, around FedEx here that you have this global weakening outlook versus some of the cost-cutting plans that has been pushing forward. And the global outlook looking pretty grim and in line with a lot of other things we have seen as well. They talked about weaker than expected recovery in Asia, although they do expect that to be a tailwind ahead, softening U.S. demand and, and domestic volumes, a little bit of green shoots in Europe, but again, not offsetting those overall uh, impressions. Um, a slew of companies have really been talking about how they've been able to reduce freight costs. It's good for the retailers, but it's not so great for companies like FedEx. Um, but, you know, in some level, we should have maybe expected this. You know, you look at something like UP, U.S. Uh, corrugated box industry. We saw sales there down 11 percent from the prior year. Uh, companies that manufacture this operating at about 70 percent of capacity. So clearly uh, this demand for boxes is uh, weakening e-commerce post-pandemic. These are something we've seen broadly in the industry and, you know, carrying through to FedEx as well. Simone, Critty pointed out to me this morning this huge amount of job cuts that FedEx plans to make this fiscal year, 29,000. Um, where do they stand on that? And, and just why is that figure so significant? Yeah, for fiscal year 2023, they had, which is just, uh, which ended actually a couple, um, a couple months ago, they had expected to cut 25,000 jobs by May. They had announced that. We got 29,000 uh, people in terms of job cuts. FedEx had really pushed to expand its uh, network of people during the pandemic just to try and make gains, uh, whereas some of its competitors, you look at UPS, kind of cut back, really focused on those smaller consumers where it could charge higher margins. This cost-cutting plan seeming to be delivered here, and maybe that's why we saw this stock retrace some of its losses in the post-market had been down over well over 5% initially, because this cost-cutting plan does seem to be paying dividends. You know, yes, investors looking at the whole global uh, story. Um, seeing that not very positive, but once again able to deliver on some of these cost cutting measures. You know, also seeing uh, things like uh, $70 million related to the decision to permanently retire from service some aircraft. Mm. Those things are one time expenses that aren't going to necessarily be a problem next quarter. Right, so it shares down about 3% in the pre market trade. Simone, thank you so much. That's Bloomberg's Simone Foxman. Now, coming up on the show with Critty and me, we're going to be speaking to Klaus Bader, Global Chief Economist at Societe Generale, on today's UK inflation numbers. And former U.S. House Majority Leader Eric Cantor is going to be joining the program on the upcoming 2024 election and the Biden administration's engagement with China. Plus, on that, just days after bilateral meetings, fresh tensions emerged from the U.S. and China amid President Biden's rhetoric about his Chinese counterpart. All that to come, this is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Krita Gupta in New York alongside Danny Berger in London. Look, all of the action this morning is in the bond market. And it comes off uh, some moves coming out of the UK as they post 
hottest inflation in 30 years. For a fourth consecutive month, uh, it has surprised to the upside. But here's the concern. For our radio audience, stick with me. We are looking at a chart here of the B Bank of England rate, the BOE rate, if you will, and the core UK CPI. And right now, you're seeing both in an almost vertical line upwards. What's important to keep in mind here is that the last time we saw the core UK CPI this high, like I said, it was 30 years ago. You have to go all the way back to the early 90s. What's important is that the BOE rate was much, much higher. We were at a 15% high rate. It's really important to keep in mind that the repricing that you're seeing in the UK bond market right now is starting to have ripple effects in the German boon market and even stateside in treasuries. So how do you trade it? Let's bring in a true expert. Bloomer's Dana El Bataji joins us for a little bit more context and expertise. What do you do here, Dana? Well, it depends on how you view the risk of recession here. And I mean, there is there is absolutely a play that's happening out there, whether or not people uh, feel that inflation is going to go higher that would then push people into the shorter end of the curve and then of course there are those that believe that if there is a recession coming then the longer end of the curve looks more uh, attractive we are seeing both plays happening but at the end of the day this is about the impact on the average person on the street how is this impacting their spending and i think when you have a society that is usually asset rich but cash poor when you've got costs that are going up this high the impact is significant yeah there's been a lot of research out there just saying look uk households are so levered right now that this impact in terms of mortgages is so much more steep than than prior times in history so how much does that handcuff the BOE in terms of them being able to hike more? I mean, at the, at the end of the day, they are fighting inflation, and that is a very real fight. And until inflation goes down, you can expect the BOE to continue hiking rates. And, and in, in spite of the risks that you're seeing to the economy because of the impact on spending, you're still finding people that expect that the BOE might even raise rates tomorrow by as much as 50 basis mm. points. That kind of hit to society is significant. However, you still need to bring inflation down. Is that the roadmap that the BOE is actually going to use, though? In terms of pricing, why not just go ahead and price to what you saw 30 years ago? It's very hard. It's very hard to answer that question because I think that we're in an un unprecedented period at this point. We're also basically um, facing an election year next year with the Tories facing a very real possibility that they might not be voted back in. So it's really, really hard to answer that question. But I think that what is quite fair, given what the BOE has said so far, they are absolutely adamant that they have to fight inflation and they have to bring that down. So you can just automatically assume that if inflation is going to continue rising or if it's con going to continue being hot, which it might actually be the case, because don't forget, we are entering the summer period. We're going to get a lot of tourists, and the, this is a service-based economy, so you can expect that there's going to be a lot of spending happening by tourists that are coming in. Meanwhile, the local economy, the average Joe that pays taxes in the UK might be suffering. That might actually give the BOE even more fodder to continue raising rates, which will be more pain for the local economy. Yeah, uh, all I can tell you, uh, Dana, is going to be hard for me to sell my flat anytime soon with mortgage rates doing what they're doing. Thank you so much for joining us. That's Dana Baltaji uh, from the Bloomberg Markets team. And for more market analysis, M Live Go is where you want to head on your terminal. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance, the early edition. I'm Danny Berger in London. Kriti Gupta is in New York. Now, some, now on to some of the stories that have caught our eye this morning. A Canadian aircraft has detected underwater noises as the search for the Titanic submersive continues. The report suggests banging sounds heard at 30-minute intervals. All communications with the vessel carrying five people were lost after just under two hours after it submerged on Sunday. And more job cuts coming at major banks. J.P. Morgan is reportedly reducing about 20 investment banking positions in Asia, adding to the 30 layoffs back in February. The bank joins Goldman Sachs and Citi's move last week as deal flows remain muted. 
And Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi is scheduled to meet President Biden later today in Modi's first official state visit to the U.S. Now, this comes after Modi's meeting with Elon Musk. Musk telling reporters after the meeting, quote, I'm confident that Tesla will be in India and will do so as soon as humanly possible. Kriti, I thought this story was interesting, specifically with Musk, because we also had Tim Cook going to India, yes, opening Apple stores there, but you get this sense of de-risking. Can you really put all of your eggs in the China basket if you're an American company? Yeah, and you're seeing that really go all across uh, Asia and arguably Europe as well, starting to seep there. Some of the investments you're seeing from the major tech names. You mentioned uh, Intel and, and potentially Apple as well. Well, you have the likes of uh, others going to Japan, going to South Korea, going to Israel, uh, for example. It's really interesting, though, to have uh, Modi back in the States, though. Of course, we know that there was a little bit of hesitation but in terms of the geopolitics between the two sides in the fallout of the war in Ukraine and how uh, India would or would not be buying mm. oil from Russia, and yet here we are collaborating on the corporate front. Can I just say, on that story about oil coming from sanctioned countries, this is a little off topic, but Javier Blas has a really fantastic tweet out talking about the fact that uh, reports of Chinese oil intake from Malaysia are at a crazy record high. Javier Blas basically writing that's actually Iranian oil. It's actually sanctioned oil that China is reporting as oil coming from Malaysia, just on, on the topic of uh, sanctioned oil. One to keep your eye out on. All right, coming up, Kriti and I are going to be speaking to Klaus Bader, Global Chief Economist at SockGen, on today's inflation numbers and what to expect from the BOE next. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomer Surveillance Early Edition. Here's what you need to know. Another hot CPI. The latest read on UK inflation comes in higher than expected for a fourth consecutive month. Gills decline as investors ramp up bets at the BOE hikes to 6%. Over in the U.S., Fed Chair Powell is gearing up for his two-day testimony on Capitol Hill. The chair is expected to face questions over additional policy tightening after the Fed paused in its last meeting. And FedEx painting a gloomy picture for 2024. The Courier's profit outlook comes in lower than Wall Street estimates amid weak demand. I'm Kriti Gupta in New York with Danny Berger in London. Danny, a lot to digest, but I got to say, I think the bond market, specifically in the U.K., takes the cake. Yeah, look, I'm not feeling super optimistic about this U.K. economy. I, I, I hope I am being dramatic here because is the trade-off stagflation or a BOE engineered recession or maybe critty? Maybe we just need to wait for those long and varied lags. If mortgage rates are above 6 percent, perhaps we're finally going to see inflation come in without having the BOE need to do anything dramatic. But in the meantime, you are getting a little bit of drama priced into this market. We've backed off of a 6 percent terminal rate from the BOE, but we're just under it, about 5.9 percent. There is a little bit of betting going on that we might need to see a jumbo rate hike, something like 50 basis points. But in the meantime, two-year yield goes back above 5 percent after falling below the level yesterday. Sterling, again, always a worrying trend when you have higher rates, but a weaker currency. Basically, higher rates not doing their thing to attract inflow and investment into the country. That's that growth worry filtering through. Pretty, as you mentioned, it's a bond market day today. German two-year yields, those react too, higher by just one basis points. Meanwhile, European stocks off of the lows, but pretty, they are still weaker today. Well, speaking of the bond market, which is where all the action is, the same story applies stateside, and a lot of it does come from what you're seeing in Europe, Danny. As you pointed out, futures, I mean, doing a whole lot of nothing. 44.32 on those contracts here, really flat on uh, the pre-market session here. The two-year yield, though, is, again, where you're seeing the action. Probably a ripple effect of what you're seeing in the Boone market and the Gilts market, as you just pointed out. 470 on that yield. Although what I will say is that about 30 minutes we did this check, and we saw yields higher by about three basis points. That has now paired just a little bit. We are only higher by about one basis point now. So perhaps tiny, tiny moves in the market, but still certainly one to keep an eye on in terms of the UK read through into the US session throughout the rest of the trading day. As we talk about yields, though, the currency market is a natural follow. In theory, if the yields go higher, then the dollar should follow. And to some extent, that's true. But I have to say weakness in the Japanese yen, giving a little bit of a tailwind to the greenback as well. 141.95 on that currency pair. And I would have to say one of the most volatile currency pairs this morning. So really keep an eye on it as essentially you see the investor 
investor community say the BOJ isn't going to be tweaking their yield curve control and not too happy about that, at least when it comes to weakness in the Japanese yen. But again, the same story applies. Recession, inflation, higher yields. Naturally, you would go to the precious metal gold trading at now at 1934. But even with all of this doom and gloom, Danny, you aren't necessarily seeing a bid into gold right now. Well, let's talk more about that source of some of the doom and gloom. It's the UK. It was the inflation data today coming in hotter than expected for fourth month, just a day ahead of the BOE decision with price pressures continuing to spread. Let's bring it over now to Klaus Bader, Global Chief Economist at SockGen. Klaus, thanks so much for joining us. Look, with these uh, CPI numbers in hand, does it look like the UK is headed towards stagflation? Well, um, if you mean by stagflation, slow growth and um, quite a bit of inflation, and yes, then I think that that's a situation that's not only affecting the UK, but others as well. But you know, for the classic stagflation, there's one really important condition, and that is that you have a major output gap, meaning that you'd have very high unemployment. But that's, of course, the hallmark of all these economies, of the advanced economies at the moment, is that even though growth has weakened a lot and inflation is high, unemployment rates are very, very low. And other indicators of labor market tightness, like the ratio of vacancies to unemployed, et cetera, et cetera, all of those tell you that you're having a really tight economy. So I'm very hesitant to use the term stagflation. OK, fair enough. If we do have a strong labor market and this feeling, perhaps because of that, um, policy isn't transmitting as normal, does that mean that the BOE needs to hike very aggressively at this point? Well, yes, I think that's that. Yes, it, it, it does have to. Um, I mean, I, we don't we're not quite in the camp of uh, the six percent. We um, I mean, currently we're at 450. We've got another two rate hikes by the Bank of England getting us to five percent. We've got the ECB going to four. But um, I think your question goes into the right direction. I've just published late last night, I published our latest global economic outlook, and there's quite a significant section in it where I, which has the title, you know, monetary policy is tight, but monetary policy and financial conditions have tightened, but are they tight? And so I look at a whole range of indicators, and it, on a lot of indicators, monetary policy looks maybe about neutral. It doesn't really look very tight, at least if you go to the period before the great financial crisis. And so I think that's what we're, the moment we're experimenting with is, you know, have we gone back into a regime where the so-called R star, the equilibrium interest rate, has actually increased again? That was the reason why the Bank of Canada started raising rates again after pausing. They said, when, apart from a number of other things, they said, actually, we now think that R star is higher than we thought previously. Well, let's bring that to the playbook for the Federal Reserve then, Klaus. When we're talking about the BOE perhaps battling inflation for much, much longer than its peers, the ECB, and of course the Federal Reserve as well, what kind of ripple effects does that have to other central banks around the world? Well, I mean, I think they're pretty much all in one boat. There's a couple of exceptions um, in the global in the global context. Um, the GBOC, of course, is in a completely different position, but they didn't let rip on monetary policy in their side. The Chinese economy seems to be losing a lot of uh, wind. I'm not 100% sure, even though the BOJ isn't doing anything, whether the um, Japanese economy is really that different. They're generating quite a lot of inflation. The point is that pretty much all central banks are in that position, especially those in advanced economies. I think, you know, when I just talked about, mentioned this idea of you know, looking at is monetary policy really tight? In a lot of um, Eastern Europe and a lot of advanced uh, and in Latin America and a lot of emerging economies, monetary policy is absolutely tight. And so I think they can quite easily embark on a course of lowering interest rates and relatively soon. Yeah. But, you know, let's take an example. The Central Bank of Brazil has raised rates by 1,175 basis points, now by 11.75 percentage points. That's a whole different ballgame than what the advanced economies, central banks have done. And even though people say, oh, well, yeah, central banks raised interest rates so, long, so much. Well, yeah, but they came from crazy levels. They came from levels which we've basically never seen before. And so I think that central banks are going to have to work a lot harder. Okay, Klaus, thank you so much for that. 
certainly see the pressure bubbling up literally everywhere for these central banks. That's Klaus Bader of SOCGen. Now coming up, we're going to be speaking to Eric Cantor, former U.S. House Majority Leader and Vice Chairman of Mo Moelis on the upcoming 2024 election and his successor, Kevin McCarthy. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Ber Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Danny Berger in London. Kriti Gupta is in New York. From a potential U.S. recession to ch tensions with China, there's no shortage of issues at the top of mind for the 2024 presidential election candidates. For a look at what is to come for the campaigns, Francine Lacqua is with former U.S. House Majority Leader Eric Cantor. Francine. Thank you so much, Danny. I have the pleasure of interviewing Eric about twice a year. He's now at MOLIS, where he's vice chairman. And of course, we speak about a range of things, U.S. politics, IPOs and mergers and what's in the pipeline. So, Eric, thank you so much for joining us. When you look at deals, when you look at investments, is, it, is there a, a pipeline shortage or do you see the, the market picking up? Well, Francine, look, th there's no question that let's say the last 15, 18 months, there's been a challenging deal market for sure. I think any way you look at it from 30 to 45, 50 percent, um, down in terms of M&A, whether it's announced or completed deals. So I do think that we, we certainly um, could see an upswing. I mean, I, you know, it, it is, I think, feeling better now than it perhaps it did a couple of months ago. Uh, and I think part of that is the reason we've got some of the issues that had confronted the markets um, you know, somewhat in the rearview mirror. We've got, you know, obviously the regional banking issue that came up as a real surprise uh, in the U.S. in particular is now sort of fading into the background. I'm not sure it's all done, but still I think the severity of it is in the background. Then with Jay Powell's announcements last week, was saying, hey, we're going to pause, unlike ECB, but saying, hey, we're going to pause, but be expecting a couple more rate rises this year. I think investors are looking to see, well, maybe we're at the end of this cycle. And obviously the equities markets are up for the most part. And, um, you know, the IPO markets are beginning to show some signs of uh, new energy. So with all that, I think that, you know, investors, the sponsor community and strategics are looking at, you know, is now the time for um, an M&A deal? Yeah, is, is that green shoots across the board or is it we're seeing so much activity in the Middle East? because of oil money. Is that going to continue power ahead and I guess, you know, c continue for private markets and IPOs? Yeah, it, it is amazing if you take a look at what's going on in the GCC, uh, you know, especially in, in Riyadh and Abu Dhabi, Dubai. I mean, it is phenomenal, the capital formation that's occurring, the willingness for those uh, investors uh, in that region to look outside the region as well as to focus on diversifying their own economy. Uh, and I do think that um, finally we are seeing a region come into its yeah. own uh, and really be a part of the global economic community now. There's a lot of sports deals. <laughs> Were you expecting, I mean, is this a main driver? You know the region very well. Well, listen, I, I think that, um, you know, much of the announcements behind the Live Golf deal and all the soccer. Uh, announcements uh, that have taken place. I think that the Crown Prince in, in uh, Saudi has certainly recognized the fact that um, his country can be a destination for tourism. He can diversify that economy, and I think he's well on his way to doing that uh, with, with a lot of excitement. I can't imagine any other region right now that is so full of that optimism. Eric, I know you're, you're out of U.S. politics, but what's your hunch for 2024? Well, you know, we're, we're going to have to see, Francine. I think once you're in politics, you never sort of always, you know, it's in your system. And, and for a long time, I was in that. So I do think that um, it, it'll take some time. We are just now beginning the primary process where the first primaries aren't until after the first of the year, right? So we've got some time. But we'll begin to see some debates on the Republican side uh, later this summer. Um, and I think what is beginning to shape up is a field that looks a lot like it did in 16, where you have multiple candidates vying for the nomination really against Donald Trump. And if you're looking at any of the public polling, you can see he is way ahead in terms of the primary electorate on my side of the aisle. So do you think Donald Trump will be the Republican nominee for 2024, even with these criminal charges? Well, listen, I, I, I do think that if you were to say now, if the primary uh, was decided tomorrow, 
Donald Trump would be the victor. Now, we'll have to see. There are many months uh, in the interim and things that he will have to overcome. Uh, but right now, it's pretty clear that he has, uh, in some polls, over a majority of the uh, primary base, we call it, the base of people that will participate in those primaries, he's got over 50 percent in some of the public polling. So there's a long way to go, and there's a long way for those candidates who have entered the race to try and close that gap. Okay, if it's a repeat of last time, do you think Donald Trump would, would beat Joe Biden? Well, I mean, you know, you, you think about this, even in the Democratic um, side of the aisle, most of its primary electorate doesn't want him to be their nominee, and I think for obvious reasons. I mean, Joe Biden is well into his 80s. He's showing signs of aging. He is not necessarily the figure that I think most Americans would want to say, hey, this is our leader for the strongest, biggest uh, you know, economic power, military power in the world, he's not really commensurate with that. So we'll have to see, but I think it's a good shot that if that is the field, if it's Donald Trump versus Joe Biden, I do think that uh, Donald Trump can win. With what? On, on bashing China? So we just had Antony Blinken also come back. He's actually in London today, but he just came back of China. Will the rhetoric around China change? Well, let, let's, let's separate out the, the rhetoric from the reality. I okay. think the reality is, and certainly the, you know, the businesses, investors that I speak with, I mean, the multinational companies, um, whether they're here in, in the UK, in Europe, or back in the US, um, I don't think there is going to be a complete decoupling uh, of our economies. I just think when you look at the enormity of the trade, where there's 500 billion plus a year between the U.S. and China alone, that's a lot of interaction. So I'm not sure we're going to see that. I do think that we are going to see on the sensitive sectors, certainly right. some concern that's been raised and some decoupling there. But this new term of de-risking, I think, is a little bit more appropriate. We'll have to see what that actually is. But in terms of the rhetoric, the politics is a one-way one street in Washington. It is bipartisan. Uh, there is a real, I think, feeling of being uh, fooled, if you will, when China entered the WTO that it was going to play by the same rules as everyone else. They just haven't. And I think this but, is the backlash. So what, what does that mean for tariffs? Will they stay as is? Are they going to get stronger? And again, there's all this like also political you know, importance because of Taiwan and Russia. So how does the economy impact the politics? Well, I mean, I, I think right now the, the politics is going to impact the, um, the, 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 the tools that okay. our federal government has. I don't think there's a lot of room for uh, Joe Biden's administration to lift the tariffs right now because mm -hmm. I think, and I think rightfully so in terms of politics, the opposition, mm -hmm. my party would come after him and say, hey, you're weak on China, we got to keep the pressure up. So I don't think the politics is going to allow a, a lot for the off ramps. But in reality, I think business is going to continue. It will continue in, in non-sensitive areas the way it has. Mm -hmm. But I think in the sensitive areas, you're probably still going to have a lot of friction. All right, Eric, thank you so much for coming on today. Eric Cantor there, the MOLIS Vice Chairman and Managing uh, Director. With that, Danny, I'm going to send it back to you. And of course, we'll have plenty more on this throughout the day. Francine, thank you so much. That is Francine Locko with Eric Cantor, Moellis, Vice Chairman and Managing Director, and of course, former House Majority Leader. Very fascinating to hear his take on the 2024 election. Now, elsewhere in geopolitics, the U.S. and U.K. have pledged billions of dollars in additional aid to Ukraine as the Ukraine Recovery Conference takes place in London. I'm pleased to say that joining Critting and me now on, his, on a stop from that conference from Austria is Alexander Schallenberg, Austria's Minister for European and International Affairs. Alexander, thank you so much for joining the program this morning. Thank you for having me. Um, look, you, you, you said in March at Butra that Russia is waging an illegal war, unjustified, unprovoked. It's been over a year now. What, what brings this to an end? I mean, very easily said, Putin could stop it tomorrow. He started it. He could stop it. Uh, and that's the very difference between the Ukrainians who are fighting so bravely and the Russians. He could stop it. If Zelensky stops, Ukraine might cease to exist. That is a big difference. And I believe that today's conference has a very important message of hope, too, because we're not talking only about it. It's not a pledging conference. And yes, Austria will continue to pledge. And we are actually so many people don't know, number one globally as far as humanitarian aid is, going, is, is concerned is per capita, per GDP in Austria, mm. um, as far as private and uh, public aid for Ukraine is concerned. But this is another message of hope saying we are talking about reconstruction already. 
I'm here accompanied by six US Austrian companies. We, have, we are number six in Western Ukraine. We continue to be there. 200 Austrian companies are there. And they're willing to start reconstruction while actually the war is still going on. And mm. there's a big message of hope and commitment to the people of Ukraine. Right. And, and uh, you can start that reconstruction now, but just in terms of helping bring this war to a close, will Austria ever help supply weapons to Ukraine? Is that a position and an aid you'd ever give? No, I mean, this position is very clear. It's known to our Ukrainian friends, and we had actually never demands from their side as far as that is concerned. We, uh, we uh, continue to be neutral only in military terms. That means that we can not deliver, we cannot deliver lethal equipment. But we're doing, as I said, much more on the humanitarian side, and we are very clearly committed. We are not neutral as far as this conflict is concerned. Austria is never neutral as far as values or international law is concerned. And if a P5, a permanent member of Security Council, believes they can apply the rules of the jungle, then Austria won't stand idly by and watch. Right. Kriti, jump in here. Minister uh, Kriti, good morning from New York. It's Kriti. I want to talk to you about where Austria stands on seizing Russian assets to help for some of the reconstruction measures that you just talked about. What, what's its stance? I believe we have to be very cautious. I fully understand the emotionality of the debate and to say we have to get, you know, hands on uh, these assets. Um, but we are defend we are rule of law states. We are defending international uh, rules based international order. And so whatever we do in this endeavor has to be absolutely watertight. And it can be challenged and it might be challenged in front of European courts or American courts. And if any of these actions were to be lifted by a judge, it would be a uh, diplomatic and economic uh, disaster, basically. So whatever we do, it has to be absolutely watertight in, in legal terms. In terms of pressure from some of your European peers who are actively freezing assets of some of the kind of Russian elite and business tycoons, are you feeling that pressure from your colleagues across the border? I mean, we have frozen billions already in, 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 Aus in Austria. A tenth of all the assets frozen by the European Union have been frozen by the Austrian National Bank. And uh, we are very clear on this. I mean, uh, uh, there's no doubt where, where we stand. And like Germany, like other countries, yes, we did have business relations. And we had maybe this naive assumption that you can... Uh, by creating mutual economic dependencies, sort of minimize political risks. But we have learned our lessons since the 24th of February. And, and of course, this idea of neutrality, it, it is in the Constitution. Do you think that needs to be revisited, especially when it comes to military neutrality? No, I mean, as I said, we are strictly only in military terms neutral. Sure. That means we don't want to join any uh, um, uh, inter international organizations such as NATO. We don't want foreign troops in Austria. But we are not neutral in any other respect. And neutrality in this term still has a huge degree of support in Austria. Over 70% mm -hmm. of the Austrian population now stand behind it. And we shouldn't forget, uh, Austria too is uh, a seat of the UN organization. And after New York and Geneva, right. it's the only within the European Union. We are seat of the OSCE, the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe. And, and 50 other organizations. So this is something where the, it still has a huge degree of support. But... But we have done something else. Mm. We have, uh, we have uh, very uh, importantly increased our military spending. Mm. Of and course. that is something, a new thing. And yes, we have a government in Austria with the Green Party, a little bit like Germany. And still this government decided for the first time in decades to massively increase our spending in military uh, in the military infrastructure. What about a role as a mediator? The Chancellor, of course, met with Putin after the war started. Has Austria had any contact with Russia since then? I mean, we have to be uh, cautious because mediation needs two, two sides who want actually to talk. And uh, the president of the Russian Federation has proven again and again uh, uh, the last time when the African delegation uh, met him in Sochi that he's actually not willing. He, wants, he believes he can still settle things on the battleground. And, and the second point is no talk about Ukraine without Ukraine. I think this must be our principle. Nobody of us being in the shoes of Ukraine would, have, would like others to talk over our heads over, um, about our own future. So these are two principles, and I would be cautious. But yes, we all know that at the end of the day, and that history proves it again and again, peace will never be settled or done on a battlefield. It's always done, even if it's only a ceasefire, at a negotiation. Table. Mm. But here again, it will be our friends and partners in Ukraine 
who will have to call the shot at the end of the day. All right, Minister, I'm afraid we're going to have to leave it on that note. Thank you so much for Thank joining you for having us. Me. That is Alexander Schallenberg, Austria's Minister for European and International Affairs. All right, as we get to the close of the hour, let's take a quick look at what's ahead today on the agenda. We're going to have Fed nomination hearings coming at 9.30 a.m. Eastern, followed by remarks from ECB Schnabel and Joachim Nagel speaking on a panel on inflation in Berlin. 10 a.m., Fed Chair Powell begins his two-day semi-annual testimony to Congress. And finally, Fed President from Chicago, Goolsby, is going to be at a Wall Street Journal Chicago Food Forum. Pretty. Certainly something to watch on the macro front. I want to bring it to the micro as well, Danny, because there are two stocks on my radar that I think are worth revisiting. We talked about this earlier in the show. Tesla very much in talks right now, potentially uh, with more investment in India. Elon Musk coming out of a hotel yesterday met with a massive press crew right off the heels of a meeting with Prime Minister Modi. We know, of course, that Prime Minister uh, of India is going to be meeting with Biden uh, this week as well. And really, tech is top of the agenda. What what kind of factories, what kind of initiative, what kind of investment uh, does India see from a lot of these big tech tycoons given uh, this kind of push to diversify? The other stock, Danny, you want to keep an eye on is FedEx, of course, moving in the opposite direction as Tesla shares down about 3% in the pre-market. Their forecast falling short of estimates uh, from Wall Street. They're talking about a global sales decline of 10% year over year and actually laying off way more people than they expected, about 29,000. So, Danny, Ooh. some pain in FedEx if you indeed look at that as a proxy for global economic activity. Yeah, I agree. I completely missed that number until you pointed it out to me this morning. That That is a painful number. It's clear it is not just tech. It's not just banking that we have job cuts. Of course, we haven't seen that filter through to the headline jobs number yet, although jobless claims have ticked up. All right, that's it for early edition. Surveillance is ahead with Margie Patel of Allspring and former IBM CEO Ginny Romady. This is Bloomberg.